So there are others here today who will be better placed to talk to you about how an author is made, so how a book goes, from the, goes through the process of getting from an author's head into my sack. But I can tell you what happens when it comes out of my sack. So who's going to publish the Kafkas of this century? And I, I would say it's certainly not one of the big five conglomerate publishers. In this country we have for the most part a conglomerate publishing industry that pl places an awful lot of focus on celebrity. And this is partly because, um, I'm sure you all know, the economy of scale. So to make money from selling a book that's very heavily discounted in Tesco or Asda, you have to sell tens of thousands of copies and you're selling to people who are buying on impulse. So they're seeing it as they're doing their weekly shop and they pass the gondola, it's on offer and they drop it into the trolley. And what motivates them to do this? Well, it's things like the cover design, the amount it's discounted from the RRP, uh, and of course the name of the author, the recognition factor. And it's hardly surprising that as the economics of publishing have become squeezed, major publishers are more and more resorting to commissioning books, often fiction, by people who are famous for something else. And I was thinking about what to say in this talk when I was unpacking my books in the office yesterday. It's something I do at the end of each day. And when I say I unpack the books, the books come up daily in, in sacks. And the sacks are about waist high. And yesterday I had two sacks and I have to fillet the books and put the ones I want to keep on the shelves in two cupboards and the cupboards are about this high and that big. And I receive about 200 books each week and I have space to review five hardbacks, uh, five paperbacks and um, one author interview and a couple of columns. And at the same time all this is happening, we have ever more creative writing teaching in universities I saw some research recently that said we have over 300 degree courses that are either single honours or part time creative writing uh, as, a, as, as an option. And they're producing lots of writers who aren't famous for anything but are just good at writing. And what does this mean when you're teaching creative writing? It's something that we grapple with. Does it mean broadening out what you teach to teach commercial fiction or genre fiction? Does it mean that you look at what's selling in Tesco and try and encourage your students to write that as a career path? But you can't teach students to be famous for something else. You can't teach them to be celebrities first and then become writers. Increasingly, I find that authors are doing their own PR, either because they're experimenting with self-publishing or because they think their publisher isn't doing a great job PR is one of the influences on me, but a literary editor has lots of pressures. Um, I have to sort of balance the demands of my editor, who wants me to have the first interview with the biggest author and splash it on the front page, because, let's face it, that sells papers. Um, lots of readers of newspaper book sections want to read the first interview with Martin Amos. There's the pressure of timing and making sure something is newsworthy if it's going to go in a newspaper. There's the pressure from the website. I don't know if a lot of authors and rev even reviewers and readers know this, but the demands on the, our website team are so high and there's so few of them that often they don't have time to upload something if they don't think it's going to get the clicks. So I have to convince them it's going to get clicks. And then you have to think how to sell it through social media and Twitter and Facebook. Um, and you have to think of whole new ways to get a book review to an audience um, who might be browsing in 10 years' time when this author wins the booker and they want to know more about them. Or they might be buying a newspaper in a shop and you've got to cater for all of them. And it's a difficult balance to strike. And then you've also got to strike the balance between how the pages are laid out and curated and how the, how the section comes together as a whole. So you, you get lots of criticisms. There's not enough non-fiction, an editor said to me recently. Um, there's not enough books by women. There is a, there's a magazine in the States called Vida that does an a annual appraisal of newspaper and magazine book sections. And generally it's about three quarters of the reviewers and the authors reviewed are men in, across the board. And, and authors do fall through the cracks all the time. So what, what can we do about this? What about this scenario? You've got a creative writing student and she graduates and she's full of enthusiasm and hope. And let's say she's a, a talented writer but unpublished and unpolished. 
And now she's graduated and she's going to work on the novel or the short stories or those poems that she's been working on while she's a student and she's going to try and get them published. And of course she needs to get a job just as a stopgap to tide her over while she writes in her spare time. And then there comes a point where she stops even reminding herself that she wanted to be a writer in the first place. And when someone brings it up, she feels a bit silly about it, a bit embarrassed, forever believing that that could happen. And I would say that's a typical story of a writer who's kind of lost forever, who could have been a really good writer and who just kind of falls through the cracks. And you might say, well, this is a self-selecting process then. Instead of you're not good enough to make it, the maxim should be, if you're determined enough, you'll make it. But then what does that say about quality, really? Um, and I try to keep in mind when I, when I go through this process every day, the authors who have written those books, because it's a very serious thing that you do when you reject somebody's book like that. Um, and I try to think what I would say to authors if I had to explain to them the process and try not to make them weep. But the best way for an author to get reviewed if I had to give any advice was write the best book you can, make it interesting, make sure I know about it in time, not six months later, and if I'm doing my job right, then the balance is, well, what, five in 200? That's how many books I get a week and how many I can review. But them's the odds and we all do the best we can. And I don't think we should be satisfied with that. I think we should try and find ways of catching these writers and encouraging them and nurturing them. And of course, lots of different writer agencies and publishers and initiatives from the Arts Council try and do that. Um, and it's something we try and do at Common the best we can. To finish off, I'm going to mention a initiative that we're working on that is trying to solve that problem and we're just at the start of it. It's a project that's lasting a year and um, it's really looking at this problem of matching the right authors with the right readers. You might be a writer who's writing something very, very specific and you might even publish it on your blog, but unless you can get traffic to that blog, unless you can get readers to that blog, it's still going to go unread and you're going to go kind of undiscovered. So we're working on a platform, an app, that is basically trying to match uh, readers and writers who have very specific interests. And the idea is it's for short stories and, and poetry, and a writer who uses it uplo uploads the text and the audio version there. So you have to upload the audio as well. So imagine a kind of short story or poetry jukebox kind of thing. And that's all well and good. But what we also want to do is use something called broad folksonomy, and that means uh, end user hashtagging. You might be familiar with it. So Twitter uses broad folksonomy. As soon as you add a hashtag to some content to share it, then that's you becoming part of the curatorial process. So on our platform, which is uh, going to be called MacGuffin, the idea is that you read a story or listen to it, and then afterwards you add your own subject matter hashtags. So that could be you know, feminist, apocalyptic, uh, you know, 10 minute stories or whatever to categorise it. And the more the community comes together and tags, then you have this huge sort of searchable database of material. And so if you're a reader then and you want to search for something, let's say you're, in, you're on a bus in London, you like crime and you've got 10 minutes to kill, and you're into feminist fiction, you can put all those search criteria in and it will look through all the material that's on there and find something that exactly means that. So in that way, it's kind of like we're trying to create a jukebox to solve that problem. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that is gonna, <laughs> that's going to catch all writers, that no longer will writers stop being discovered or stop finding readership. That would be an absurd thing to say. But it's a kind of example of what we're doing, and I think more publishers should look at ways of doing things like this. To kind of, not only to serve writers that are coming through and getting lost, but to serve readers who are going along Tesco and thinking, oh, I used to like reading, and now there's just this in front of me. Because if that is the best that we can do as a literature industry, to serve up celebrities and models and retired MPs, then I don't think we're serving readers very well.